I'm Taylor Riggs and for Emily Chang in San Francisco, this is Bloomberg Technology. And coming up in the next hour, who is steering the chip? Chipmaker AMD reports third quarter revenue in line with estimates. Remember, it was nearly three months ago the company slashed its full year guidance and highlighted new products. We have the details. Plus, Tesla owners, they talk. Bloomberg conducts the biggest survey of Tesla drivers to date, 5,000 in fact. What they have to say about what Elon Musk is doing right and wrong. And it is tech's big two. Facebook and Apple poised to post earnings Wednesday. More on what Wall Street wants to hear. But first, our top story. Shares of AMD fluctuating in after hours trading after the chipmaker reported third quarter earnings that met analyst expectations for both the top and the bottom line. And that includes about an inline fourth quarter revenue forecast, suggesting the number two maker of computer processors is gaining ground on rival Intel. For more, I bring in Bloomberg Technologies' Ian King, who covers the chip industry for us. Let's talk a little bit about the share price reaction falling in after hours trading. Was the forward guidance a little bit light around about 50 million dollars but you know nothing to really panic about the stock was up then it was down then it was up and really what they had to do was meet a pretty high bar that they'd set for themselves and they've kind of done that and also with the forecast as well there or thereabouts we're talking about 50 percent growth from a year ago so that's obviously not not bad um, you know I hope people hope for more when they put so much money to work in the stock and, and they but they didn't didn't get any upside. Well, and they have put a lot of money to work. I'm coming into a chart that I'm showing here on my Bloomberg terminal showing really just for the quarter the stock was already up about 14% year to date. So how much of this was expectations really high and then how much was actual some some good news from the company that we got today? Yeah, I mean the, the, it's the perfect mixture of people got what they expected to get. On the, the bad news continues to be this um, chip division that sells into Microsoft's Xbox and the Sony PlayStation 27% down. People just aren't buying those machines now. They're quite old. We need new ones. But everything else is pretty much up. We want more details though. I mean, that's what people want. So gaming, if I'm reading you yeah. right, was down. What about some of the PCs? We've heard PC shipments have been strong. Some of the data center uh, mm. CPUs and GPUs, did that see some strength this time? Yeah, I mean, that's absolutely where AMD has to show strength because that's where all of the new products have become. And it absolutely did. They said, you know, higher shipments, higher average selling prices, higher revenue. The server division though, is its performance is buried in inside that unit we just talked about, which has those custom chips for Sony, for Microsoft. So a little bit hard to pass that one. They just said though, you know, in general terms, better than 50% growth for those epic chips that go into the servers that cost so much money. What are the higher margin chips and are you seeing enough sales of those? Yeah, again, the, the epic stuff that I just mentioned, that's the one we really want to see them do well in if you, if you want to see, you know, AMD break out of this the cycle that it's in of being the second player to Intel. That's where it can hit Intel. That's where, it, you know, the margin on those kind of chips is absolutely enormous. Well, and Intel has had a big stronghold. Mm. Where is AMD making gains, like you were saying? And yeah. frankly, we've been hearing that they're making gains for a while. Intel, though, has yeah. been holding on. Yeah. Are you seeing enough yet to sort of pivot that scale? Yeah, I mean, in, in order of strength, High-end desktops, the kind of things that the computer gamers love, AMD has definitely made a move there. The volume of the market, though, is in the laptop computers. There we're seeing slower gains. AMD's got some better chips coming next year. And the third sector is, again, back to the data center, back to supplying Google, Amazon, AWS. There, the chips are relatively recently in the market. That traditionally moves more slowly, so we're seeing some progress but not massive share gains were nowhere near the quarter of the market that they were more than a decade ago they're still in the single digit percentage point i want to come and take a look at another chart that we're showing in my uh, terminal here for our audience which shows sort of the historical volatility that you typically see around earnings mm -hmm. and then volatility sort of dropping off and for all of these companies nvidia intel amd mm -hmm. did you get anything today from the earnings report that either would push volatility higher or not or did this feel very much in line. Yeah, I mean it was very much in line, but you have to remember AMD has been 
an edge case for so long. You know, they were a company that was struggling to even survive. If you're talking a few years ago, people were concerned that. So there's been a lot of short interest, a lot of fast money, a lot of volatility in their stock. So they're not traditionally a read on what the rest of the industry is doing. The fact that they came in in line, the fact that things were roughly where they were supposed to be is actually a good sign for them and, and helps the PC case in general. And so could we do any read throughs to some of the other chip makers or mm. any sense that maybe the trade war has calmed down for now? Yeah, I mean, we'll have to hear what they have to say on the call. I would imagine there would be questions about the general demand environment, which, you know, the CEO, Lisa Su, will have to answer. But she's really been concentrating on the look. This, these are our new products. This is where we're making gains. You know, their story is very much what damage can they do to Intel, what damage can they do to NVIDIA in graphics, or for one of, if not damage, then at least gain back some of the share that they have lost over the years. Well, and like you said, the analyst call uh, right now has yet to start. What's the one thing you want to hear? We, we want to hear more about that server unit. We want to hear where those sales came and, and really get some more precise numbers. Bloomberg's Ian King, thank you so much for joining. Now, embattled office sharing startup WeWork wants to get into video gaming. Despite being in a cash crunch, WeWork applied for a trademark in the UK under the name Play by We. And sources say it's already hired a handful of staffers. The new venture comes as WeWork is said to be belt tightening by selling off some of its businesses after its delayed IPO and restructuring. For more, I want to go to New York and get Bloomberg Deals reporter Leanna Baker. So, Leanna, why e-gaming right now? WeWork is looking for different ways to make a profit and different ways to leverage all of its office space. And a lot of investors have done pretty well in the esports space. Uh, Comcast has been building a $50 million sports arena in Philadelphia, for example. So WeWork probably is looking to get in on this. The question is, is it too late? Esports has seen a lot of growth in the past few years, but it may not be the time to sort of double down on a new area that isn't in the core of WeWork's business right now. Right, so Leanna, explain this to me, because in the last month we saw them try to sell off some of their quote non-core strategies, get out of the education business, really focus on office sharing. So how does e-gaming fit into their core strategy? My Bloomberg colleagues who reported out this story said that WeWork had applied for this license, but we don't know when WeWork uh, had originally started looking into this, so it could be part of the old establishment of WeWork. So it's really unclear where its esports plans will go from here. There were LinkedIn postings looking for more staffers in this space, but until the company sort of rolls out its plans, we won't know how serious it is about esports. There's a lot of companies, though, in the sector, a lot of video game firms, Activision Blizzard is huge in, in video games. So it could be a way for WeWork to just expand its core business of looking for tenants. So that's one way to think about it and how it might uh, link into the core business. But as for stadiums or how it plans to really branch out, it's very unclear at this point. Well, and there's been a lot of concerns about WeWork's business model because it hasn't been tested in a downturn, in a recessionary environment. If they were to go in this e-gaming business, any sense that this would help offset some of those concerns about what a company looks like in a recessionary environment? It makes sense that WeWork would be trying to find different avenues of growth, and esports is definitely growing, but it's so crowded. There's many companies looking to profit off esports, so it, it has to be seen whether there's room for a new player. It seems like a curious time to be expanding in an area that involves a lot of investment. And I'm curious what SoftBank would say about this uh, recent move. They put in uh, another $9 billion into WeWork recently to bail it out. So it's going to be also up to what SoftBank thinks about this venture. Okay, so you are leading me there. You mentioned the word SoftBank, and I have to ask, it's just been a week or so since they infused the company with more cash. Any sense of how this is going in the last week? Bloomberg has definitely reported that Marcelo Cloré, the new chairman of WeWork, is looking to turn this around, to cut costs. He might bring in his own management. So it's still early to see how this company is going to turn around. And we'll see you know, what the future holds. There could be a thesis for SoftBank to try to recoup its large investment, maybe in an IPO next year. The company definitely has to figure out a way to get an exit for its big investor. A uh, story that keeps on giving this time with Bloomberg's Leanna Banker. Thank you for joining.
And speaking of gaming, Electronic Arts posted second quarter adjusted earnings per share that beat analyst estimates. EA shares rose in after hours trading. The company has been under competitive pressure, but is looking forward to the release of Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order in mid-November. And coming up, a new SEC filing shows Tesla's U.S. sales tumbled in the third quarter. What it means for the electric car maker next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. You can listen on the Bloomberg app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. Despite reporting a surprise third quarter profits, a new SEC filing shows a nearly 40% drop in Tesla's U.S. revenue, which is its largest market. The electric automaker saw those sales fall about $2 billion in the latest quarter compared to the previous year. Sales, though, in China rose to almost $700 million from $409 million. Now, Bloomberg is hearing from Tesla owners directly in the biggest survey of Tesla drivers ever conducted. Bloomberg pulled almost 5,000 Model 3 owners with a 164 item questionnaire. The data reveals that Tesla has finally figured out how to deliver cars with fewer problems. Here with the story is Tom Randall, who covers Tesla for Bloomberg News. Tom, let me just talk about that SEC filing quickly here before we move on. I want to come and show a chart of my terminal. We know the story, 97,000 cars. Did you learn anything new, though, from this report in terms of the geography of those sales? Well, not too much. I mean, I think what we're seeing here is, is an artifact of them continuing to expand their geographic footprint overseas. So looking at that uh, year over year, number Number, you know we're comparing that to the third quarter of 2018 and that's when you know Tesla finally figured out how to really mass produce cars and they started cranking them out and they flooded the, the US market with the Model 3 to satiate two years of built-up demand so after they kind of satiated that demand they moved in February to start selling uh, cars overseas and so of course um, their US numbers dropped considerably you know I think some people will look at that number and say oh is this you know a warning signal signal that that U.S. demand is, is dropping off a cliff. Um, you know, I just don't think that there's a lot of evidence to support that. If you go to Tesla.com right now, um, there, there, there's a two month wait um, to get a Model 3. And that's, I think, the longest wait that they've had uh, since about this time last year. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think it's a, it's a, it's a signal, it, you know, it's, it's representative of what's happening as they expand, you know, expand overseas and kind of smooth out their, um, their production. But it was a record uh, quarter for uh, unit sales and I think we're going to continue to see that ramp up as uh, we see their their Shanghai factory going. Well, and Tom, you're not just sitting there being a talking piece. You're actually doing the work and rolling up your sleeves and, <laughs> and questioning 5,000 Tesla owners. Generally, as you take a look at the first part of the survey, what is the key takeaway? Okay, yeah, so this, is, this really is a massive survey. I mean, it's n nothing like that's ever been conducted for uh, Tesla. And what we really wanted to get at is now that Tesla is cranking out 100,000 cars about uh, per quarter, um, you know, what is the experience of owning one? And and, and you know, can they provide the kind of quality and experience of a Volkswagen or a Toyota that's going to attract the next round of like more mainstream buyers? Um, so we started by looking at quality. You know, there's two there's two kinds of quality. There's the driving performance and, and high tech features that people love about Tesla and, and people just raved about those things. And then there's the kind of quality about you know manufacturing quality and precision. And we measured that by asking first. You know, how many problems did you have with your Tesla when you first received it? And we found that that rate peaked uh, in Q3 of last year, uh, you know, that we were just talking about. And in that quarter, you'll remember, that's when Tesla famously created a whole new production line uh, in their parking lot under a tent structure and uh, tripled production. And since then, their defect rate has dropped uh, significantly, and it's down 44% in the third quarter of 2019. So what was the most common complaint that has now gone down? 
So most of the complaints um, are, are superficial in nature. You know, it's uh, paint defects, uh, Im imprecise panel gaps, you know, the gaps between the, the different body panels, um, dents and scratches, uh, these sorts of things. And, and these don't really affect your driving experience, um, but in the automotive industry, people see that as kind of a signal that, that attention and care is being paid and that, you know, if you can provide a perfect paint job, then you're, you're giving that same care to you know what's inside the car as well and you know those are the things that gave Tesla a whole lot of trouble uh, early on we found that 12% um, of Tesla Model 3 owners had some kind of issue um, with their paint um, so we did see a lot of those early on and those are those are continuing to get better and does it bode well for the company that the complaints, as you mentioned, weren't structural or mechanical in nature and that they were purely cosmetic? Or do they need to do a better job of getting the whole thing right? Well, I mean, they certainly weren't purely of a cosmetic nature. I mean, we did see some issues that were unique to electric cars and uh, unique to Tesla. Um, there were several electric motors um, that had to be replaced. Um, we had at least one uh, battery, high voltage battery, that had to be replaced. Um, so it's kind of painting a picture of you know this is a different this is a different kind of car um, and you know they also had software defects uh, that they had to deal with that most car manufacturers wouldn't have to deal with because they're not offering these kinds of advanced features but most owners said that these software issues were fixed in over-the-air updates quickly with with really no um, loss of convenience of their vehicle so you know I think we're seeing signs that Tesla is becoming better at offering the kind of quality that one would expect of a mass manufactured car and and overall Tesla owners truly love the car I mean I think I think one of the indications of that is uh, you know when we ask people about their favorite features about the car 99.6% um, of drivers said that uh, it was a pleasure to drive um, and well, part one uh, part mm -hmm. one of four of a survey we know you can't drive the car until you charge it so we await part two of your series coming later this week thank you so much that was Bloomberg's Tom Randall. And coming up, C-Trip is China's leading online travel agency. But how have U.S.-China trade war and the Hong Kong protests impacted its growth? That's next. This is Bloomberg. Let's take a look at the top tech calls. Shares of Beyond Me tumbled Tuesday after analysts from Wells Fargo, Credit Suisse, and Bank of America cut the price target on the stock. Wells Fargo cut the stock to $100 a share, saying competitive entrants are ramping up through the first half of 2020, leading to competitive turbulence for the stock. And shares of Alphabet slid in Tuesday trading, even as analysts hailed the company for their stability after a turbulent start to the year. Analysts at JP Morgan said the Google parent company reported no fireworks in contrast to previous quarters, though the tech giant's performance was strong all around. They raised their price target to 1460 from 1420. And shares of Grubhub plummeted to their lowest level in more than two years at one point on Tuesday. This is after the food delivery company gave a fourth quarter outlook that was well below expectations. Analysts are extremely bearish on the results with at least three firms lowering their ratings and others slashing their price targets. BTIG analysts said, quote, we struggle to find any silver linings in these developments. And now C-Trip is China's leading online travel agency and parent of travel sites like Trip.com and Skyscanner. The company provides one-stop travel services such as accommodation and ticket reservations as well as vacation packages. Despite rapid growth since its start in 1999, the company has seen its shares decline amid tensions like the U.S.-China trade war and Hong Kong protests. C-Trip CEO Jane Sun spoke to my colleague Bloomberg's Tom McKenzie in Beijing. Take a listen. People probably still will travel, but maybe instead of traveling uh, four times a year, they might reduce to three times a year. Maybe instead of traveling long haul, they might be traveling uh, to Asia or within China. But I think travel for middle to high end uh, customers almost is a natural uh, during their golden week holidays, uh, Chinese New Year or summer break. They will bring their family to travel. Mm. Is top line growth being weighed down by this near term 
weakness in, in the economy? Uh, the Hong Kong Taiwan situation, yes, mm. it has a negative uh, uh, impact on our top line. But uh, uh, I think these are you know one one time kind of thing. Uh, so we will uh, see through it and mm. still make a strong investment in the long term. How would you say? How would you characterize the impact, the broader impact of the mm. trade war on your business? I'm very hopeful that the leaders from both countries will have the wisdom to focus on our shared interest. And there are so much things we share together uh, and mi maximize our shared interest. Uh, only then, I think, both countries will be benefiting from our collaboration. We know, of course, tourism in Hong Kong, into Hong Kong and out of Hong Kong, has been under significant pressure. Mm -hmm. Can you quantify for us how it's played out for Sea Trip mm -hmm. in terms of the demand from mainland tourists looking to travel and stay in Hong Kong? Mm. The one-time impact we roughly estimated is around 5% of our total revenue. About 5%? Mm. Okay. Mm. Um, do you, when do you expect that to, to turn around? Mm. Uh, hopefully, you know, the uh, area will be stabilized very soon. So, uh, again, I think uh, both uh, government um, and the people uh, will look into the future, right? look forward what is the best uh, for Hong Kong. A, a big focus I know recently has been to grow in lower tier cities, mm -hmm. so smaller cities in right. China. Right. How much success have you had there mm -hmm. and what are your targets for growth? There was one target I was seeing is of, of an additional 50% of revenues coming Correct. from those smaller tier cities. Correct. Are you close to meeting that target? Correct. Uh, we have uh, about 8,000 offline stores mm -hmm. um, and the growth empowered by these uh, offline stores is tremendous. And we also put a lot of efforts uh, in uh, further penetrating into the third tier, fourth tier, fifth tier cities. And so far, it's working out very well. The uh, year over year growth for lower tier hotels in lower tier cities uh, is more than 50% year over year. So we are confident in that. Mm. And you expect those kind of numbers to continue in terms of growth? Yeah, yeah. I mm. think uh, as long as we keep uh, with our execution, uh, we'll be able to gain more market share. That was C Trip CEO Jane Sun. And coming up, electrification is proving expensive. One major U.S. automaker says it's going to be putting most of its money into EVs, not combustion engines. We discuss next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm Taylor Riggs and for Emily Chang in San Francisco. All eyes are on electrification. On Tuesday, General Motors laid out an aggressive approach to electrifying its vehicle lineup, saying that the bulk of R&D will be spent on EVs and not combustion engine cars. But is demand for EVs still there? In a regulatory filing, Tesla reported that their U.S. sales fell 39 percent in the third quarter. The numbers continue to raise questions about how much incentive is needed to keep customers enthusiastic about electric cars. Joining me from New York, it's Morgan Stanley analyst Adam Jonas. Adam covers the automotive industry and shared mobility. Adam, great to have you. And Thanks, one Taylor. of your most recent notes really highlighted the connection between climate change and EVs. As you look at the landscape, how much does climate change start to really drive the shift to EVs? So. Taylor, first, thanks for having us on. And, and I just got back from Morgan Stanley's inaugural uh, Sustainable Investing Summit, uh, where we had a couple hundred uh, clients skewing very senior towards CIO and portfolio manager that's really focused on this topic. Uh, and look, you know, here we are 111 years after the Model T, the average car on the road emits almost five metric tons of CO2. Okay, there are 40 tons per second of a CO2 emitted by the, all the cars in the United States. It's 40 tons a second. Uh, and yet the world's most valuable co auto company, Toyota, makes zero EVs today. 
it's, it's, it's kind of a shock. And then on the flip side, you have the world's most shorted auto company, Tesla, that only makes EVs. So something has to give, and investors really want to understand how to play that multi, multi-trillion dollar shift in capital as we reinvent this industry. Something has to give. And how does technology play into this? I think of early days at Tesla when I wasn't sure if Tesla was a tech company or an automotive company. Where is technology in this? So we think Tesla is more of a software company and a hardware software fusion company that uh, you know, in, in an ideal world will be covered by a tech hardware analyst rather than the auto analyst community. So we'll take what we can get. We think the connection between tech and autos is when you see these large multi, uh, the trillion dollar tech platforms like Amazon, Alphabet, and Apple that are clearly have their sights set on the auto industry as a domain. Not necessarily to make cars, but perhaps Apple wants to turn your car into an Apple store, right? And so as they try to look at this internet of cars marketplace, it's a multi-trillion dollar market, they are getting drawn in to that 40 tons per second in the U.S. ecosystem. And it's happening within cities um, where, ride sharing, where a ride-sharing vehicle might emit 25 tons uh, in a year, uh, five times more than the average car. And so as tech firms get close to that autonomous vehicle topic and the shared and connected car, they're being drawn in and they have the resources and the capital and frankly the obligation to do something about it. You know, Adam, also in your other latest report called the Global Electric Vehicle Market Monitor in October of 2019, you talk about within the U.S., we're down year over year, but we're up year to date in terms of U.S. sales in the battery electric vehicle market. As you look out into 2020 and beyond, paint the picture for me. Where are we? Is there demand? So we think the stock market is still defining EV adoption through the completely wrong lens, Taylor. They're looking at it through the lens of, uh, wealthier people buying cheaper and cheaper Teslas in a suburban community for your home. Like the retail experience of personal ownership. That's gonna grind along and I think that your segment before, Tom I believe who did that 5,000 survey uh, on Tesla was absolutely spot on with his, with his observations and conclusions. Um, but we think that where the stock market is moving to now in terms of analyzing EV adoption, it's fleets and it's it's shared vehicles. So in order to make the large shift, to get to like 2% EV adoption in the US to 10, 20%, it's gonna be the regulatory purview of a dense community like a city, going after logistics, taxis, shared mobility fleets. That's how you can get the big chunks. And again, that's where the money is. That's where the business model can make use of EV infrastructure and use data and software to solve the problem instead of just leaning on the 100-year-old legacy ecosystem to do it. That's getting blood from a stone if you try to do that. As a fundamental analyst, do you assume further margin compression because you have to give out discounts to lure in buyers? So uh, if all else equal, Absolutely. We think if, 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 the, if the EV market, to the extent it's just a machine with software that has to perform with incredible reliability, that will get hyper-commoditized over time. Short term, however, you do have Tesla uh, shifting production or at least expanding uh, production into China where labor costs are roughly a tenth and where logistics costs and other costs that go into a car are a fraction. So there's going to be some volatility. Um, and as auto companies have proven before, if you have a, a highly utilized factory at that cost base in China, you can do some pretty interesting things with the margin. They may not be sustainable, but uh, I'd, I'd, I'd be prepared for some interesting developments there. Is Tesla the clear winner? Who was second and third place? Where's GM? Where's VW? So we think all the legacy auto companies are going to get drawn into this, uh, even if they would like it to move very slowly, or else they won't be able to sell vehicles in the state of California with the current footprint, and they certainly won't be able to sell vehicles that are operated in cities like New York, London, Oslo, Norway, most Chinese cities, Los Angeles. So again, it's going to move at the pace of, of those cities that are going to take matters into their own hands. They're all going to get into it. But Taylor, if you ask me who's the biggest competitor to Tesla, we don't think it is Toyota or General Motors right now. We think it is large tech firms that are worth a trillion dollars or worth more than all of my auto companies combined that generate cash 
that are equal to my entire industry combined, and it's more of a regular recurring, ca recurring cash. These are the types of companies that have the ability to attract talent and capital, and frankly, to lose money if necessary to take on someone like Tesla. Tesla spent $20 billion on R&D and CapEx over the, over the last decade. That kind of thing is going to be a difficult uh, task for a legacy auto company to replicate. They're going to attempt to do it, but we think the real threat is from the megatech. Who is the biggest loser and is what's the problem? Is it CapEx spending, R&D? We think the biggest losers would be companies that have to defend a declining business model that is at the margin uh, obsolete, internal combustion technology, for example, that can't be repurposed into uh, electric, for example, and, and, and or doesn't have the backing from the state or a national policy to be able to absorb losses from flipping the business model. Now, there might be a lot of people on your program listening saying it might sound like the average auto company, and it is. So I would say the average auto company that can't make that cultural transition would be the loser. The, the question and what we're seeing, depending on the boardroom that we're engaging with, is some auto companies really have a high level of urgency and have kind of you know, accepted that they need to go all in on this, but they're going to require some planning and some support from regulatory bodies, governments, and perhaps some creative legal structures in order to attract capital on a competitive basis. It's not going to be easy, unfortunately. Not going to be easy. You heard it there. That was Morgan Stanley's Adam Jonas. Thank you for joining. And coming up, Amazon may challenge the lucrative Pentagon cloud contract it lost to rival Microsoft, and the company puts President Trump squarely in its sights. Details ahead. This is Bloomberg. Amazon is signaling President Trump may play a prominent role in its challenge of the Pentagon's cloud contract going to the competitor Microsoft. With more, it is Bloomberg's Matt Day in Seattle. So Matt, talk to me. You know, we'd heard originally from Amazon. All they had originally said was they were surprised by the decision. What else now are we hearing from the company? To be clear, that's still all that they have said is that they were surprised. Um, but we have heard from sources that Amazon is considering their options for exactly what to do next. And there's uh, some signs out there they might have to move quickly. Uh, government rules, depending on what kind of protest they may want to file, give them as little as, as 10 days from the date of an award to launch a formal protest. And so we know that uh, Amazon is uh, pretty busy evaluating its options at this moment. So assuming they do pick a battle, what are their arguments? I think the, the most obvious one that observers on the outside have keyed in on is just the involvement of President Trump uh, in the award, or, or alleged involvement, we should say, at this point. Uh, earlier this year, he um, made the kind of precedent-shattering uh, choice to kind of discuss that ongoing contract in, uh, in public in a way that sort of echoed some of the criticisms that some tech companies had of the contract process, seeming to suggest that the, uh, the deck was stacked in favor of Amazon. And so that's likely going to feature in, uh, in whatever protest should Amazon decide to take that route. Any sense of how likely it is that they could win? They face a, a steep challenge. I mean, Amazon's rival Oracle um, showed that earlier this year when they tried to challenge an element of the contract, even before it was awarded, said they were unfairly excluded from it uh, based on some ties that uh, Amazon employees had had to the Pentagon. That was, uh, was thrown out by a judge, just showing how hard it is to prove um, that a, a, a contract, or rather that the government um, improperly awarded uh, a contract. Courts tend to give a lot of deference to awarding agencies in these cases, but I think, again, just given the uh, amount of stuff in the public record from President Trump on Amazon, they're likely to at least make the effort. One uh, thing that uh, contracting experts have pointed us to is that there's a chance that uh, maybe the public hearing would, would force a revisiting of the contract or perhaps portions of it, um, but I think there's a long road ahead regardless of what Amazon chooses. Bloomberg's Matt Day, thanks for joining. Thank you. Now we take a look at Facebook. They're set to report earnings after the closing bell. 
on Wednesday. Now, despite regulators' greater scrutiny, Facebook's ad revenue should remain robust due to consumer strength and the ongoing transition to stories. Bloomberg Intelligence expects third quarter results to reflect the mobile ad environment, yet the focus will shift to spending going into the U.S. election. To continue to what we should expect to hear from the company and their earnings report, I'm joined by Bloomberg Technologies' Kurt Wagner. Kurt, let's just talk about ad revenue. Facebook, Google, they dominate the space. We heard from Google, really good ad numbers. Do we expect the same from Facebook? Yeah, analysts are pretty optimistic. This is going to be a strong quarter. Uh, and if you look, Snap had a pretty good quarter. That's another advertising business. Twitter was a little bit down, but they had some wonky excuses for why that might be the case. And obviously, you mentioned Google. So typically, not all the time, but typically, these companies tend to move uh, together. And the optimism for Facebook is definitely uh, high on the ad revenue front tomorrow. How much more scrutiny are we going to be digging through those financial statements to figure out the money they're getting from political ads? Well, they don't break that out, haven't historically, and they've admitted that political ads are a very small part of their business. Usually um, after the election or after the midterm, they'll come out and, and there will be a report, a couple hundred million dollars worth of, uh, of ad revenue. For Facebook, that is a drop in the bucket. Obviously, there's a lot of discussion around their policies, which are probably a lot more important and a lot more interesting to most people than the actual money they make from the ads. So I don't think we're going to hear a lot from them about that as a business tomorrow. We may hear from them a little bit around the policies but again political advertising for Facebook and for Twitter has has kind of been historically small and we've talked a lot about Facebook some of those user growth slowing so then we shift to Instagram which has been such a key driver of growth for them what do we need to see on Instagram? Well, Facebook has not broken out Instagram revenue, but obviously there are estimates uh, that others come up with that show that Instagram is definitely the biggest driver of growth for the company right here. That could be something that would be incredibly interesting if Facebook were to actually uh, put that as its own line item tomorrow, kind of give us a peek as to how important Instagram really is to the business. More likely, we'll hear a lot of talk about uh, how strong it is and how they're very happy with it with not a lot of real numbers to actually back that up. You're not allowed to come back till you give us full numbers. <laughs> I'm just kidding, Kurt. You're always allowed back. Okay, let's talk about the monetization of WhatsApp because yeah. there's a slew of other companies that they own. What do we need to hear on WhatsApp? So Facebook, I think it was like two years ago that Mark Zuckerberg came out and basically said, hey, we're putting ads in Messenger. We're really excited about this. And people kind of lost their mind. These analysts spent the whole call asking questions about messaging ads, uh, and Facebook did not have a lot of answers. We still don't know how much they make for Messenger. And the point of me telling you that is that these are a slow, moving uh, part of Facebook's business, right? They continue to make most of their money in the news feed from Instagram and messaging is seen as something that they will get right uh, hopefully at some point in the future. So I do expect them to talk about improvements they've made uh, with WhatsApp or with Messenger. Um, I do not expect, similar to Instagram, for them to talk specific numbers. And on the analyst call, how much of a distraction will antitrust, data privacy, Libra be? compared to just the fundamentals of the business. Well, I mean, the, the, the big threat here, could Facebook get broken up? There are a lot of people who think that's a, a real rare uh, chance of that happening, um, but it is a massive threat. It would totally dismantle the entire thing that Facebook built. So I do expect them to ask some questions. I don't know how much Facebook can say, given that these are regulatory investigations, but the last time we heard from them was the day that they had paid a $5 billion fine to the FTC. So I do think it's fair to say, hey, wh what's going on with these other things going on. Do you anticipate that there could be some kind of financial penalty uh, as part of these investigations? As far as I know, uh, this is probably a ways down the line, so we might not hear specifics tomorrow, but uh, we have heard uh, a lot from them on this front in the past. Well, and analysts have said that some of those big headwinds are what's hampering the valuation and the multiples of the company. So thank you. That was Bloomberg Technologies' Kurt Wagner. And still ahead, we continue our earnings preview, how the iPhone 11 sales may have impacted Apple's fourth quarter. That's next. This is Bloomberg.
Apple is set to report earnings after the closing bell on Wednesday. The company's September 10th launch of the iPhone 11 lineup likely left many potential buyers on the sidelines in advance, leading to a soft quarter for iPhone sales. At 55.6% of year-to-date sales, the iPhone still holds sway over Apple's revenue growth, which consensus sees flat versus last year's fourth quarter at $62.9 billion. To discuss, I'm joined now by Angelo Zeno. He's CFRA research analyst. And here in San Francisco with me, it is Bloomberg Technologies' Mark Gurman. So, Mark, give me the lay of the land quickly with the iPhone 11. How much of that, the few weeks of that, we'll see in the earnings report? Yeah, so investors and analysts are really excited about the iPhone 11, even though it wasn't a big update. We've seen the stock price seriously rally since that September 10th announcement. But the reality is, is we're looking at another year of flat or a decrease in iPhone unit sales and a drop in iPhone revenues despite the higher prices. So it's not really truly good news, but I guess investors don't think it's as bad as it could have been. And Angelo, I bring you in here because I read your report and you're expecting better than expected iPhone sales. In your opinion, what is driving that demand? Yeah, I mean, you know, so we would agree with Mark in the sense that, hey, listen, September quarter isn't going to look all that great on a year-over-year -year basis. Um, I think, you know, what, what investors are really getting excited about here is the, the estimates were reset earlier this year. Um, we're now setting up essentially a low bar environment here going into to fiscal year 20. And our view is you could potentially see a return to unit growth in the December quarter, partly due to the fact that we saw Apple kind of lower that price point, that entry price point down to 699. We think that helps in a number of geographic regions. We do think you see some better than expected results or at least commentary out in China. And if we get all that, um, even if you kind of get an inline type of number, we think that bodes well for the shares. And Angelo, you're okay with that, even though they don't have 5G for about another 10 months or so. Yeah, that's actually a positive in our view. So, um, you know, essentially, this is a, a, a point in time right now where um, even if Apple were to miss um, or to guide lower, um, let's say here over the next couple of quarters, we think investors will largely look, overlook it and essentially buy any sort of dip in anticipation of that 5G device in the fall of 2020. So, Mark, the problem with all of this is because they're so dependent, at least for the moment, on those very cyclical iPhone sales, um, they need to sort of transition or continue to transition to services to help balance out uh, the volatility there. What do we expect from the services side? Yeah, and, and to your point, Apple really has not shown the ability or, or imminent willingness to come out with a product that is going to add seriously high percentage points, like the iPhone is over you know, 50% of the overall revenues. But you know, services will extend the life uh, of the iPhone for Apple, right? It allows them to add new things like the Apple Card and the Apple Pay. But at this point, it doesn't seem any of the services are, are going to make a dramatic jump individually, but it's that you know continuation of the App Store and those things together that is going to help Apple in the next few years. Angelo, what is the inflection point for you where services offsets the highly cyclical iPhone sales? Is it three years from now, five years from now? Well, I think that's an interesting question. I, I think in terms of the top line, I don't think you get there anytime soon, right? Um, but when we start thinking about potentially, let's say, the services profits, and when you think about the margin profile, right, right, you're talking about 2x that of the hardware business. So when you start looking at the margin profile of services and you actually lump in, let's say, wearables, because we do think wearables is a very nice growth driver for that company, the combination of both those businesses, services, and wearables, we think could exceed, let's say, you know, the rest of their business, let's say, over the next three to five years in terms of the profits. And Angelo's the integration of healthcare with the watch, as you mentioned, wearables, the next key of growth, in your opinion? We do think healthcare is an absolutely enormous opportunity for the company. Um, when we actually see some of the potential, you know, incremental service opportunities as it relates to, to where, uh, to the healthcare industry remains to be seen. But yes, I mean, we do think healthcare remains an absolutely critical part of the Apple story long term. It will be driven by wearables combined with potential services offerings on that side of things. Mark, the macro backdrop appears to have improved. We got potentially a phase one of the trade deal. Any sense of if that is a game changer or not yet for Apple? 
Yeah, you know, there was a lot of discussion when Apple had that iPhone sales slump in China that that was in part due to the trade war. I mean, I guess from a perspective of people not wanting to buy American products in China, that could have some influence. But Apple's problems in China are much deeper than the presence of a trade war or, or no trade war. It comes down to lots of companies really being specialized in terms of services and apps and other offerings for that Chinese market, where Apple really has not optimized much of its offerings for that market in any specific way. Angelo, quickly here, you said you're waiting some positive comments on China. How's the trade war in your opinion? Um, you know, at the end of the day, we think, you know, there's been somewhat of an easing, um, at least in the near term for Apple. We do agree with Mark in the sense that, hey, listen, longer term, I do have my concerns, and I actually think the biggest ris ri risk for Apple long term is going to be China because of the competitive offerings out there. Um, but that being said, we think near term, Apple should be okay in terms of the, the China play. And Mark, on a similar story, you were at a Samsung developers conference. They unveiled a foldable phone. What was your takeaway from that new set of hardware? Yeah, so that's a, a new look for their foldable strategy. Right now, it folds open like a book. Now it's going to fold open the other way, sort of like a small makeup case. Uh, very interesting new form factor, but in, hopefully for them, it, it succeeds a little bit more than the current model. A makeup case. Yes. I like that. Angelo Zeno of CFRA and Bloomberg Technologies, Mark Gurman, thank you both for joining. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. And Bloomberg Technology is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Technology. Be sure to follow our global breaking news network at TikTok on Twitter. This is Bloomberg.